Kenya at Rochester Institute of Technology, and his work focuses on how infrastructure systems in the global south can be planned in an integrated and sustainable manner to promote sustainability, economic, and social development in underserved communities. So um, today he'll be talking about how to electrify a country in the 21st century. Um, over to you. All right. Thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit today about my work on sort of electricity access, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, but first taking a look back at how electrification happened um, in this country, and you know, what can we learn, what have we learned over the last hundred years that might inform doing things differently um, in countries that haven't yet achieved universal access. Um, really excited to be here. Um, I think audience is mostly undergraduates, I understand. Who here is from Washington State, local folks? Anyone from Longview by chance? I'm curious, no, no Longview people. Okay, so I grew up in Longview, Washington, just down I-5. Um, I thought it might be interesting, since we have a little bit of something in common, I, we're both from the same state anyways, to tell you a bit before I start about how I ended up going from a logging town, uh, Longview, Washington, to working on electricity access um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so I grew up in Longview, Washington. I was an Ari Long lumberjack. Um, I went to, did my undergraduate studies out east in Spokane uh, at Whitworth University where I studied math and physics. I thought I was going to be a theoretical physicist, um, but ended up taking a bit of a detour. I joined the Peace Corps uh, after I graduated. I spent uh, two years in a rural community in Burkina Faso. Who here could find Burkina Faso on a map? A couple people. All right, you guys are above average. Um, I once, in South Africa, actually, told somebody I'd spent time in South Africa, or in Burkina Faso, he said, who's she? Um, anyways. Um, so I spent a couple of years teaching math and science in a rural community that had no electricity access. I ended up building a little small solar home system um, to have lighting and, and, you know, power my radio. But that's where I really got interested in energy and energy poverty and how even just a small amount of electrical energy, for example, can go a long ways in improving people's quality of life. Um, and then I ended up sort of getting um, sucked into Africa. I did a master's degree at Nelson Mandela University in South Africa, uh, where I was studying um, sort of small decentralized renewable energy systems. Um, met my wife and stuck around a lot longer than I intended. Spent several years developing utility scale wind and solar power projects. Um, in South Africa, um, and then went back to graduate school uh, to really study how, how can we use decentralized renewable energy technologies um, to address the energy access challenge um, across the world, and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, was research faculty for a couple of years at Carnegie Mellon's campus um, in Africa, in Kigali, Rwanda, uh, before I joined RIT about three years ago. Uh, so certainly, when I was sitting in your seats, I never would have imagined I was doing what I'm doing now. Um, so uh, anyways, I think it's interesting to learn about people's paths. Happy to answer questions about my background uh, at the end as well, if that's interesting. Um, now I work for the Golisano Institute for Sustainability at RIT, uh, where we think about sort of systems level uh, sustainability challenges across various sectors. Um, I assume you all sort of know generally what sustainability is, um, but we think about it as having sort of uh, three main components, the sort of triple bottom line aspect here uh, that we need to both uh, protect our environment, um, you know, make sure we're not uh, using our resources unsustainably, but we necessarily have to do that in a way that's economically sustainable. Um, but really the goal here, at least from my perspective, which is a bit anthropocentric, uh, is that we're doing these things to advance our social goals, right? Making sure that uh, we have societies uh, that provide for all people's needs um, and do so in sort of an equitable and just way. And so a lot of the work that I do focuses on uh, the sustainable development goals. Who's heard of the sustainable development goals? Some of you, it's fairly... Familiar concept? That's good. Um, not every room that I've been in is familiar with the SDGs. Um, so I do a lot of work focusing on SDG 7, which focuses on um, access to clean and affordable uh, electricity uh, for all. Uh, but it intersects a lot with some of these other goals, too, which I'll touch on 
a little bit as we go. Um, so jumping into the main topic here, um, you know, how many of you are actually familiar with how electricity expanded across the United States? Is that a history that some of you are familiar with? It's such a big room. Normally, I would ask you this, but you're like a mile away. Um, but um, so you know, a lot of times, sort of the um, sort of advent or the beginning of the electrification era uh, is cited as sort of the invention or the patent of the incandescent light bulb in 1880 by Thomas Edison. I think most of you have pro probably heard of him. Uh, and it started off very small scale. So early users of electricity sort of had these small decentralized electricity generators uh, powering primarily light bulbs. This started out uh, in New York City. This is on the top right here, a depiction of the Pearl Street Station, which was the first commercial power plant um, commissioned in 1882. And then starting in sort of the 1890s, uh, there was a shift uh, from these small distributed generators to sort of larger centralized generation of electricity uh, to capture economies of scale and sort of bring down costs. Uh, and this was aided in sort of the development of long distance transmission of electricity, which allowed then us to um, generate electricity at large scale closer to the source of that energy at the mouth of a mine or at a hydroelectric power station. Uh, and so what we see at the bottom right here, this is an, a figure from the Institute for Energy Research. It's a little bit small, but I'll tell you what it says. Uh, this is looking at the average price of electric energy from 1902 to 1930. And at the beginning of this period, around 1900, electricity cost about $4.50 per kilowatt hour. Uh, according to this data, um, I'm sure this is estimated, but this is 2013, real 2013 US dollars, um, and came down pretty drastically at the beginning of the 20th century uh, to about a dollar per kilowatt hour in 1920. Is that a lot or a little? How much, does anybody here pay an electricity bill? How many undergraduates? OK, some of you. How much does electricity cost here? Is that expensive? Maybe. You're not sure? That's very expensive. Uh, I think in upstate New York, I pay 13 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so a dollar is, is pretty expensive, but it's certainly less than 450. Um, and so this centralized sort of model allowed the cost of electricity to come down quite drastically. Um, but it, in the mid-1930s, electrification rates were still quite low. Around 10% of households, rural households, had access to electricity. Um, and it was the Rural Electrification Administration that was established in 1935 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt to try and help finance access to electricity in rural areas. A lot of that was driven by electric cooperatives, which are these sort of um, customer-owned, not-for-profit utilities. Um, sort of by 1960, we were getting close to universal access. Uh, we don't have universal access today. It's close to it. There's a lot of uh, tribal communities, in fact, that still don't have 100% access to electricity. Um, but we're pretty close. Um, so hundreds of thousands of miles of transmission were built. Uh, I, they did a lot of advertising, the Rural Electrification Administration. I think these are fascinating to uh, look at. But, um, but they were actually advertising electricity to users because it was a new thing. It was a new technology at the time. Um, you're electrical engineering students, so you probably know all of this already, but sort of the way that the power system developed then was large central generating stations that get transmitted at high voltage um, from you know, the power plants to the load centers that get stepped down and delivered to customers, really designed around um, sort of unidirectional flow of power from the power station down to the end users. And you know, the power system that we have today, this is a map of the US electricity grid. Um, it's sometimes called sort of the most complex machine that's ever been built. This is a large sort of interconnected machine with hundreds of thousands of uh, circuit miles of transmission. Um, there's over 1.1 million megawatts of generating capacity. Um, about 25,000 generators across 12,000 power plants. That's really an incredible achievement, um, technically, um, serving hundreds of millions of customers. Um, this is the map of all the power plants from the Energy, Administ Energy Information Administration across the country. So 
our power system is really an incredible technological achievement. Um, but there's been a lot of progress in the last hundred or so years since we started electrocating, or electrocating, that's a weird word, Electrif electrifying um, the United States. Um, there are still parts of the world that um, haven't achieved universal access. Um, and so the question is, you know, how sustainable is our power system? Um, and, you know, I think if you were all sitting in the front row, we could have a discussion. But I was just like you sitting in the very back row, too, so I won't uh, <laughs> judge you on that. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of problems uh, with our power system. We have new renewable energy technologies that our system wasn't necessarily designed around uh, incorporating. A lot of our generating technology is um, not very clean or friendly to the environment. Um, and so there's opportunities now to ask the question, if we were to electrify a country today, uh, what would we do differently? Um, I'll let you think about that, and we can have that discussion as we go. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunities to, advance, to take advantage of sort of 100 years of technological process, progress. We know new things now about how um, energy technologies affect the environment, so there's opportunities to do better. Um, and so this leads to this idea of sort of technological leapfrogging. I don't know if this is a familiar concept, um, but sort of in development speak, the um, traditional way of thinking is that developing countries are these sort of lagging economies and that they catch, over, catch up over time by sort of following the path that was charted by um, developed countries, as we call them. Um, and, but there's this opportunity then that countries can sort of skip steps, that they can leapfrog um, by skipping some of these um, technological stages, excuse me, that developed, let me grab some water here, countries followed and, and actually developed more modern um, um, infrastructure systems to support their development. Um, the classic example is mobile technology. Um, this figure here on the left, uh, your left, um, shows, so here in uh, this blue line here represents developing countries. The darker gray line here represents um, developed countries. And this is on the y-axis, the number of um, fixed and mobile subscriptions, line subscriptions per 100 inhabitants. Um, and so what we see here, if we look back, who, who has a fixed line telephone? Does anybody have a fixed line telephone? Has anybody ever had a fixed line telephone? Some of you, okay. I grew up with a fixed line telephone. Not that type, I'm not that old. Um, but uh, certainly didn't grow up with cell phones. Um, the number of fixed line uh, self, or subscriptions in developing countries was around sort of in 2005, 10 per inhabitant. Um, people didn't have access to uh, telecommunication services. Um, the growth of mobile subscriptions in developing countries was so rapid because it's actually more expensive to develop, to you know, put telephone lines across an entire country. Uh, and so, you know, the classic example here is that most parts of the developing world leapfrogged fixed line telephones and went straight to mobile. And in fact, it's, this is still somewhat dated, 2009, this is saying that roughly 100 inhabitants per, 100 lines, 100 subscriptions per 100 inhabitants, um, even in the develop, or developing world. Um, and so, you know, phone subscription rates are approaching sort of developed country levels. Uh, now in the developing world. Um, and so there's opportunities to think about, you know, as with the communications industry, um, how can we do things differently? How can we benefit from these new technologies? Another uh, thing that the mobile revolution enabled in sub-Saharan Africa is a banking revolution. Uh, who's heard of mobile money before? Anybody heard of mobile money? A few people. Um, basically, you can do all of your banking with your cell phone uh, 
um, in a lot of countries, particularly in East Africa, in Kenya in particular. Um, you can pay your taxi driver with your cell phone account. Um, you can pay for your electricity bill. You can pay for your electricity, uh, top up your meter using your cell phone in a lot of these countries. Um, and so a lot of people will actually never have a traditional sort of commercial bank account um, because uh, mobile technology sort of enabled people to leapfrog that fixed infrastructure. Um, and so in the energy sector, there's been a huge, um, there's been huge advances over the last decades, uh, bringing down the cost of decentralized energy technologies. These are sort of learning curves for um, silicon uh, PV modules. Um, in 1976, the cost per watt of um, solar was about well, close to $100 per kilowatt hour. Um, this chart ends, I think, in 2014. I think we're around like 30 cents per watt now um, for silicon PV um, solar modules. Uh, so the cost of this technology has come down drastically, uh, which makes it a lot less expensive to generate, generate electricity uh, in a more decentralized way, in a more local way. Um, we're earlier in the learning curve for energy storage, which is also critical for uh, sort of off-grid electricity. Um, but we're as well seeing um, large drops in the cost of electricity storage. Um, so there's an opportunity here. Um, and there's also challenges that we have here um, in adapting our sort of legacy infrastructure to incorporate these new technologies. Our system wasn't necessarily designed um, for bidirectional flow of power. Um, you know, it's challenging to balance supply and demand with variable and intermittent renewable technologies. Um, our system isn't very smart. Um, I got an email a week ago from my utility in New York saying they're going to give me a smart meter. A lot of the communities that I work with in Africa had smart meters from the beginning. Um, and, and we're seeing a lot of, well, let's not go into utility death spirals, but there's a lot of challenges um, in incorporating these new technologies into the existing infrastructure in the United States and other parts of the world. Um, at the same time, there are about 770 million people in the world that still today don't have access uh, to electricity at all. Um, this is actually a picture from when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. It's showing up, it's a little bit dark here. Um, but I had a small 15 watt solar panel. Um, and every night I'd put a, a light outside of my house and the neighborhood kids would come and they'd be able to do their homework at night rather than using kerosene lamps, which are uh, both expensive to fuel, uh, the light is poor quality, uh, it emits particulate matter, which is poor for respiratory health. Uh, and so a small 15 watt solar panel can go a long ways um, in changing uh, people's quality of life. Uh, what we might, well, depending on how quickly I go here, come to is also thinking about how can we not just improve people's quality of life, but improve their livelihoods and um, support productive use of electricity. Um, this is a little bit dated at this point, but I, the point remains. Um, this is data from the International Energy Agency. On the left, this is the number of people without access to electricity in different regions of the world. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is in red, India is in blue, uh, green is other parts of developing Asia. We have uh, Southeast Asia in yellow. What's striking here, what I think is fairly obvious, is that the electricity access challenge has been particularly persistent in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, where much of the world is making progress. Um, in fact, the number of people without access was increasing rather steadily for a long time um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, that trend had reversed a little bit in this sort of period that's missing here from 2016 to present, but actually reversed again uh, during the pandemic, uh, where the number of people without access started to increase again. Um, so there's a persistent challenge with electricity access in the region, uh, and this is part of the challenge. Uh, so this is UN population projections for Sub-Saharan Africa, or sorry, for the world. Sub-Saharan Africa is in red here with the square boxes. Um, and that is astounding, I think. Um, basically, the expectation is that the population of Africa uh, will be rivaling that of Asia by the end of the century. By mid-century, the projection is that the population will roughly double to two and a half billion people. 
Um, and so this is a different way of visualizing electrification. This is the electrification rate. And whereas we saw that the number of people without access was increasing, the percentage of people with access actually has been increasing over the same period. Um, why is that? Well, because the population growth is outpacing uh, the growth in connections. Um, so this is a huge challenge for governments to provide infrastructure, not just for the population today, but for the population in the future. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, so this is, I think this is a very interesting table here. Let me take a moment to explain it. Uh, on the left here, this is population without access. So the red here is mapping where most of the people without access to electricity um, are living. Um, on the right, uh, this is a survey from Afrobarometer that looked at um, the quality of electricity connections. So uh, this is going from zero to 100%. The dark green are people that said they have connections to electricity and it works uh, most or all of the time. In the lighter green here, they have a connection, but it only works about half of the time, occasionally or never. Uh, and in the purple here, these are people with no connection at all. Uh, so one thing to note is that Africa is a continent. There's 54 countries. The situation in these countries varies vastly. We can't generalize as much as that makes it easier. Um, but we see, one, a segment of countries that have huge fundamental access problems where the network or the system is not reaching people at all. Uh, but we also have countries like Nigeria is always the poster child for poor quality electricity, um, where, in fact, a good number of people have connections, um, but there's just the system is so unreliable uh, that most of the time there's no electrons flowing through those lines. Um, so there's challenges, but there's also opportunities, right? Um, and because the continent is not unconstrained by legacy infrastructure. It's not as if there's no development at all on the continent. And I want to be careful not to paint a very dim picture that it's just a dark continent where nothing's happening and people live in huts. That's not true at all. Um, but there is a deficit of infrastructure which provides opportunities to think differently about how to um, provide access to energy services uh, for people on the continent uh, that supports development goals. Um, and so one of those areas is thinking about um, moving away from this centralized system um, that we have here and thinking more about um, decentralized technologies to provide access to people, at least initially, um, to electricity services. Um, and so, um, you know, sort of the traditional model um, is to have the centralized system, which expands from sort of the inside out. Um, but the sort of technological advances and cost um, decreases in a lot of these particularly renewable um, technologies like solar uh, puts in play other alternatives to the central grid. Things like mini grids, which are sort of uh, community level power systems. They generate their own electricity locally. Um, solar home systems, which are decentralized again to a household level and then down to sort of picosolar devices. Um, and so which technology makes the most sense depends on things like how close are people living together, what's the density of load, um, does the load density justify building out a fixed network, uh, how close are they to existing grid infrastructure, and how much electricity do they use. And one thing that we see that I'll touch on is that a lot of people, when they first get access to power, um, use very little um, of it, which begs other questions, but we'll get there. Um, so, you know, when I say solar home systems and pico solar devices, these are things from portable lanterns with integrated solar panels and batteries. Sometimes those can also charge your cell phone, all the way up to larger household systems that can power small devices like maybe a small refrigerator, televisions. But they provide different levels of service. A lot of the work I do is within the sort of mini grid or micro grid sector. And there's a lot of interesting things. Actually, I could give a lecture on this, too. Uh, a lot of interesting innovations happening um, in the developing world around these uh, decentralized mini-grids. Um, the debate between AC and DC is sort of recurring in some of these communities. Some developers are looking at building out DC systems rather than AC systems. 
um, some of these companies that I'm noting here that are operating sort of privately on the continent, developing power systems for rural communities, are looking at moving away from energy-based business models or revenue models. So they're not selling kilowatt hours, they're selling direct access to services. So you have a subscription to lighting and to television rather than purchasing an appliance and then having to um, pay for the energy to power that appliance. Um, they come in different sizes with different generation technologies. But there's a lot of innovation happening in this space and there's a growing literature that is finding that in fact these technologies are less expensive to provide for energy needs uh, in much of rural Africa. Um, this is a paper that uses a model called ONSET. This is a geospatial electrification planning tool uh, which takes in geospatial data on you know, where people live, what electrical loads are, where existing infrastructure is, where there are energy resources, and it tries to compute what's sort of the least cost um, technology to provide electricity in these places. Um, and there's some different scenarios here depending on uh, prices of fuel um, and our assumptions. So when it says tier five, tier three, tier one, these are, you can, these are from the multi-tier electricity access framework. Anybody heard of that? I would doubt. Some people, excellent. Um, so higher tiers mean higher consumption of electricity, basically. It's a little more complicated than that, but I won't get too far into that. Um, but what they're seeing here is that a lot of times then in these scenarios, so green here is mini grids, for example, um, a large parts of the continent would actually be potentially better served by mini grids than actually extending the electricity network, which is in blue. Um, orange here is standalone systems. Uh, you see a lot more standalone systems, for example, when you have lower levels of electricity consumption in tier, tier one and three. Um, so there's a lot of work that's been done looking at what actually would be economically the best way to approach electrifying countries today. Uh, we did some work in rural Kenya, in Mombasa County, um, trying to understand uh, essentially how much money are utilities losing by extending the grid to rural communities. Um, essentially what we did here is uh, we had physical infrastructure data, so we had geospatial data on the electricity network. Uh, we could estimate the cost of that infrastructure and allocate shared costs um, between communities by connection. And let me explain this figure because it's a little bit complicated. Uh, but basically, uh, above zero, we are looking at revenues normalized to one. Um, the normalization factor is the total cost per connection in these transformer communities. So we did this analysis on the level of a rural transformer. And um, essentially what we did is we looked at, uh, we have data as well on the amount of revenue that these customers are bringing in because we know how much electricity they purchase. And you can compute the net present value, the difference between costs and revenues. And for the vast majority of these, um, we found that utilities are losing about on average $5,000 per connection over the lifetime of connection by expend, extending the electricity network. This is just accounting for cash flows, <clears throat> the revenues. Um, and so in the, the shades of gray here are harder to describe, but the, the top uh, part here is basically computing the difference between cost and revenues. That's the implied subsidy that these customers are getting. Uh, we can see only a fraction of these 130 or so communities actually make a profit. That's that little gray triangle at the top. Um, but what's happening here really is that um, transmission costs are very high relative to the amount of electricity uh, that connections are consuming. And so as part of this analysis, we looked at those very same communities and said, well, what if we built a decentralized system, a mini grid, uh, to provide access instead. Uh, how do those costs compare? Um, and we found that a minority, I think it's around 37% of those communities would have been lower cost electrified with mini grids. Um, but in terms of cost, um, those communities that would have been better off with mini grids represented 
54% of the total subsidy. So these communities are disproportionately expensive to serve. Uh, sort of the average subsidy that we computed for a mini grid is around $3,300 or $3,400. Um, and so we could be allocating uh, resources much more efficiently if we think beyond this traditional approach of extending the grid. Um, and so the question is, should we be following this traditional approach where we expand the system centrally, or should we be thinking about working from the edge and working our way back in using decentralized models? Now, there's a lot of both technical and policy challenges in achieving this, um, but from a high level anyways, the economics of decentralized electrification, at least on paper, um, seem to be more attractive. Um, this is recognized by the International Energy Agency. Um, this is, I mean, not getting to the weeds on what these different scenarios are, but basically what they're saying is if we are to achieve universal access by 2030, uh, we need to be investing very heavily in mini grids and standalone systems um, to achieve that goal. Um, so it sounds great. Um, if this decentralized approach is the best solution, why isn't it happening? <laughs> so today, well, AMDA is the Africa Mini Grid Developers Association, which I do some work with. They estimate that about 500,000 people are served by mini grids in sub-Saharan Africa. That's compared to about, now, and this is a global number, um, about 500 million people uh, globally that are being served by solar home systems. Uh, but there's a lot of challenges non-technical challenges. And in fact, this is why I, coming from a technical background, uh, moved into, I did my PhD in engineering and public policy, because the engineering part sometimes is the easy bit. <laughs> um, it's getting that technology to work within the larger system, the social, the economic, uh, the political system. Uh, getting that technology to work in that environment is much more challenging. Um, so what are some reasons why this isn't necessarily working. For one thing, rural electrification generally uh, doesn't make a lot of financial sense. Um, there's a World Bank study that found that of all of the utilities in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, only two of them actually recover their costs. So most of these companies um, are spending a lot more than they're bringing in, particularly when they try to expand access to rural areas. Rural customers cost more to serve, but they bring in less revenue. Um, so there's finance challenges. There's questions about who pays for this. Uh, with the central system, most utilities in sub-Saharan Africa are owned by um, the government, and so they have access to finance that private mini-grid developers do not have. There's a lot of politics around energy as well. Um, the government wants to be perceived as the one that is uh, providing the results, and so there's um, pressure for uh, utilities to um, publicly owned utilities to be the ones that are making these connections. Uh, there's a lot of policy, regulatory, and institutional challenges. It's not clear how these two systems will work together, particularly if they're owned by different operators. Um, so there's a lack of coordination. Um, and another issue that we've been looking at is um, we really need to plan not just for the supply of electricity, uh, but also how do you support demand for electricity? Um, here, our sort of need or demand for electricity is already developed. And these communities that have never had access, their lifestyles are designed around not having electricity. Um, they never have had it. And for this reason, a lot of times when we move into new communities, electricity consumption is typically very low. Um, this is a paper from one of my colleagues, uh, Simone Phoebe, at all that looked at um, electricity, median electricity consumption per month um, in rural Kenya. This is divided by year of connection. So looking at when were these customers actually um, connected to electricity service. The x-axis here looks at not a calendar date, but the time since that connection was established. And on the y here we have monthly, uh, median monthly consumption of electricity. Um, and so what we're seeing here is that um, for older connections, uh, roughly 30 kilowatt hours per month uh, is typical. That's not a lot of electricity. Does anybody here know how much electricity they use in a month in their household? No? Nobody. Okay. 
I use a lot more than 30 kilowatt hours. Um, but as we move further into rural areas, if we look at more recent connections, some of these people are using you know, 15 to 20 kilowatt hours uh, per month total electricity. Um, we've done similar work using utility data from Rwanda. There it's even lower. Seven kilowatt hours per month is a typical rural household connection. Um, this is data, this is on a log scale here. Uh, apologies for that. Um, but this is mini grid electricity consumption in Tanzania. Um, and so two here would represent 100 watt hours per day. The average consumption of electricity on these mini grids uh, is somewhere around, I think, 140, 150 watt hours of electricity per day. Um, keep in mind the price point is very different here. This is a grid connected situation. Uh, electricity prices on some of these mini grids is closer to a dollar per kilowatt hour um, simply because <laughs> low consumption divided by a large fixed cost to distribute energy uh, means that the cost per unit is going to be very high. Um, so there's a big challenge on the demand side. It's not just about supplying connections, it's about enabling people to use those connections uh, both for social reasons, uh, but also for economic and productive reasons. And this isn't a new problem. Um, I find this fascinating as well. Um, when the United States was electrifying, the Rural Electrification Administration did road shows where they would advertise appliances in rural areas, telling people how great electricity is. Um, we sort of take that for granted now. These are posters on um, advertising the use of electricity um, in the United States and I think probably the 30s and 40s. Um, in fact, I think you can find some videos on YouTube, too, um, advertisements from the Rural Electrification Agency. Um, so one of the questions we try to answer is, what's preventing people from actually using this electricity? We have this assumption, I think, maybe, and this is one of the challenges in working in different communities and contexts, we come in assuming we live with electricity, and it's fantastic. And of course, everybody's going to want it, and they're going to use it in large quantities. Um, that's not what we observe, necessarily. Um, why is this? And there's different hypotheses we could come up with. Um, one of the obvious ones is that it's just unaffordable. Uh, average incomes in these uh, rural communities is in the order of sort of hundreds of dollars per year, per capita. Um, there's as well the possibility that people just aren't aware of the services that are available from electricity because they've never had access before. Um, one of the challenges that we investigated, actually June and I wrote a paper together, uh, looking at, well, maybe there's just barriers to acquiring appliances to use power. Because kilowatt hours themselves aren't particularly useful, right? If I gave you a sack full of electrons, there's not much you can do with it. Um, if you don't have appliances, you don't really benefit from that. And so there's um, economic barriers to actually acquiring appliances. Um, and we can't rule out as well that maybe this thing that we call electricity, which we think is so fantastic, they're just not interested in. <laughs> um, so one of the pieces of work we did was, well, what if we give, lend people a bunch of money to buy appliances? Um, and so we worked with, what was everybody? It was like $200,000, I think. This was in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, we actually worked with Minigrid developers and an organization called the Minigrid Innovation Lab, and we offered appliances on finance to um, customers in these rural communities to the tune of $200,000. Uh, and the things we wanted to know was, well, one, is there demand for appliances? Does that suggest that actually uh, acquiring appliances itself is a barrier? Um, from the Minigrid perspective, to bring down cost of energy and improve their financial viability. The hope is if people have more appliances, they'll use more electricity. Um, so what effect does this have on electricity consumption? And two, if we're lending people money, do they actually pay those loans back? Um, and we had no problem spending $200,000 on appliances. Um, so I think the indication there was that there is definitely a barrier um, to acquiring appliances that if we offer credit uh, that people will take that opportunity. Um, this here, this figure, is looking at, um, actually June knows this figure better than I do, but this is the change in consumption. This is the treatment effect on the y-axis in kilowatt hours. Uh, so zero is sort of the baseline before appliances were delivered. And then looking at 
Um, the change in consumption relative then to zero represents the week when the appliance was delivered. How does electricity consumption change? What we found here was actually interesting. Um, as intuition might suggest, electricity consumption did increase when we delivered these new appliances. Um, but what we see is that over time, uh, we see a regression in that electricity consumption um, back closer to sort of original um, electricity consumption levels. Now, we don't necessarily have data to uh, test why that is. Um, some hypotheses are, well, uh, first of all, electricity in these communities is prepaid. Um, and that's typical on the continent, is that you purchase units of electricity before you consume, consume them. Um, people don't necessarily know when they get a new TV how much it's going to cost to power that television. Uh, and so over time, people adjust the way that they use electricity. They adjust their behavior to this new appliance. And because they are budget constrained, they simply redistribute their electricity use between those appliances to fit in that budget. And so the effect on actual electricity consumption overall um, might be limited because of that. But we also saw that this effect varied by type of appliance. And that if you look at appliances that are used more typically for income generation, uh, things like refrigerators, which you probably think of as more of a domestic appliance, but in a lot of these contexts, refrigerators are used um, in businesses that are selling products like cold drinks, um, that those appliances saw more sustained changes in consumption. Uh, on the loan side, about two-thirds, I think it was two-thirds, repaid their loan roughly on time, although they were continuing to repay after the end of their, their loan period. Um, so that was one experiment that we did, uh, trying to understand these barriers to electricity use and how can we um, design interventions to alleviate those. Um, how are we doing on time? I'm a little... All right, I'll speed up here. Uh, other, other piece of work is thinking about how do we co-plan between infrastructure systems and services. Um, the idea being that electricity, again, by itself is not that useful. Um, it's what we can do with that electricity. This is me trying to farm in Burkina Faso when I had more hair um, when I was younger. Um, so the idea here is that really we need to think when we're planning, not just about how to supply electricity, but how it's going to be used and how do we support that use. Uh, we've done some work trying to map out um, potential for irrigation, for example, small-scale irrigation. Um, because of time, I won't go into too much detail, but, but what we're doing here is trying to map out the technical and economic potential uh, for irrigating various crops. So we used a biophysical crop model to estimate uh, water requirements for various crops. Um, we converted that into energy requirements based on water resource data. Uh, and then we can do some economic calculations on you know, what's the cost for, for irrigating these crops, because we can as well estimate yields or yield changes due to that irrigation. Uh, and then we have a factor here where we're looking at water availability. Um, so how do we factor in or plan across sectors um, so that we're not just supplying electricity, but providing opportunities to use that electricity? Um, so this is my last slide. We're almost there. Um, pulling things together. So I guess the question here from the beginning was, um, are there opportunities for African countries to leapfrog to more decentralized electricity systems? Um, I don't know that I have the answer to that. But I think there's opportunities. There are a lot of practical challenges. Um, you know, I think continued technological progress is important. The cost of storage, for example, is still a significant cost barrier. Um, we need to think a lot about how we adapt policy regulation and in institutions to new technological realities. Uh, a lot of the policy environments and regulatory environments in these countries are built around this legacy system. Uh, the centrally, or centrally operated, that means I'm on time. We started late. Um, uh, and we need to think more about integrated planning of infrastructure. Um, it's hard to silo these systems. They're very interdependent. Um, we need to think better about how we allocate resources. Um, all right, that's my, that's my spiel. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, happy to stick around for questions. And then my email is here, too, so if you want to get in touch, happy to Great. chat. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Um, there is a question. <laughs>
Could, could you describe a little bit the appliances that you were providing in this yeah. experiment? Yeah. So we didn't necessarily restrict what appliances could be acquired. It was sort of left to the customers. Uh, I think the biggest seller was televisions. Um, a lot of these communities are very rural. There's not a lot of things to do in your spare time. So a lot of people acquired TVs. Um, those were one of those appliances where the electricity consumption wasn't so sustained in terms of increases after that was delivered. Um, there were a lot of, uh, a good number of refrigerators. Um, those were pretty common. Um, what am I missing, June? I think those were the top two. And there were some other things like egg incubators and um, things for haircut clippers, businesses, people doing sort of barber shops and things like that. Uh, so smaller appliances. Uh, blenders, there were some blenders too. Um, like making smoothies. Uh, um, yeah. But TVs far and away are the biggest seller. Some of those could be productive because actually some of the largest consumers in these communities are video clubs where people come and watch the Premier League on the weekend and drink cold beer from the refrigerators. Um, <laughs> that's the, the place to be, but yeah. Oh, one right. last question. One question from you, all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious, are there any, like learning from the history of the US and how electrification happened, are there some like lessons learned that would be important in the context of like Sub-Saharan Africa, especially yeah. in how systems of government, I think a lot of like the government too heavily Government, for sure. Part, but, yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, on the governance side, or just sort of the organizational side, a lot of electrification in the United States was co-ops, these sort of um, customer-owned utilities. Currently, the mini-grid sector is very much driven by private developers. Um, I think there's challenges there in their ability to raise finance. There's a need to engage communities more deeply um, in that way. And so I think there's potentially things to learn from the co-op system, for example. I don't know that you can copy and paste it into a new context, uh, but there's some interesting things to learn there. Uh, and that persists today. I mean, there's a lot of communities in rural Alaska which are isolated systems just because they're so remote. I've visited some of those um, that are community-owned cooperatives that provide their own, provide for their own energy services, right? And of course, they're the ones that understand their needs the best. Um, but there's challenges with skills and financing with that sort of model too. So there's some thinking to be done there. Um, yeah, but even on, I mean, I think <laughs> oftentimes people doing this work think it's, think it's so novel we're doing this really exciting appliance finance innovations, but actually we've kind of done this 100 years ago, we just forgot. Um, the context is different, right? Um, but certainly there's plenty to learn from the past, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how, I'm gonna just, speak about it. My question is about the different like stakeholders and how do you approach work like this that has such sort of a massive scale of different stakeholders. So like working at a university, working with the companies, working with the customers, the government, uh, government agencies, like how, how do you approach that sort of landscape of yeah. large scale research? That's an excellent question. Um, and I think it's something that requires some, some care, as actually June and I were talking a little bit about this over breakfast, in that um, we as researchers come in with our own agenda, and we're trying to be helpful. Um, but are we being helpful, or are we just taking people's time and spinning their wheels? Um, you know, a lot of our work is not directly with communities, but working with utilities, for example, in these countries, uh, and with the ministries that oversee them. Um, so trying to work through sort of the existing institutions within the country. Um, I mean, we're not trying to be disruptive in that, um, in that way, so it's, it's collaborative. We've done work with uh, utilities in Rwanda and Kenya and Uganda. We've done some work in Ethiopia with the Ministry of uh, Irrig what is it? MOWI, uh, Water, Irrigation, and Energy. It's a weird mix. Um, <clears throat> and, and so, you know, we try to partner with local organizations uh, that are doing work. I do a lot of work with off-grid electricity companies, and these are private companies, but <clears throat> they are engaged with their customers. We can help them with some of the technical research side. So, for example, we've worked with a mini-grid developer in Kenya. Um, all of their customers have smart meters. They're collecting hourly electricity consumption data. They know exactly when they top up and how much. 
Um, it's large volumes of data. They collect surveys. They know a lot about their customers. They're very engaged. Uh, but they don't necessarily have the skills and bandwidth to actually explore that data and understand what they can do with it. Uh, and so some of our role has been you know, looking at those data sets and saying, well, can we make better models of uh, sort of forecasting electricity consumption? So you can plan around that um, you know, sort of the status quo approach had been, well, we'll just ask everybody how much electricity they need. <laughs> um, I'm only slightly exaggerating. Basically saying, what appliances are you going to use? How long will you use them? Like, people don't know these things. But you've collected all of this data that tells you, you know, this type of customer, you can expect them to behave this way. So how can we build some sort of data-driven models, applying some very simple ML to make better forecasts, for example, of electricity consumption? Um, you know, so certainly we don't see our role as coming in and um, solving the entire problem, but supporting those people that are already established in those communities um, to support them in that work. Um, and as well, drawing in, like a lot of our, my graduate students come from the continent and they've worked in the industry and they understand that context even better than I do, right? Um, so it's really about partnership and engagement. Um, and there are a lot of stakeholders, so it, it can be complicated sometimes. Yeah, that's an excellent, very insightful question, actually. Um. Good job, Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.